Welcome, everyone. And uh, I'm very excited to be uh, hosting this uh, first symposia of the winter quarter. And we have an exciting day planned for you with presentations on supply chain and recycling. So my name is Jimmy Chen. I'm the, co I'm the managing director of Storage X. And I've been asked to host this uh, given an emergency that Will had to leave on. So um, our first speaker is Yuan Gao. Welcome, Wen. <clears throat> so uh, as a quick introduction, Yuan has 25 years ex of experience in the complete supply chain of lithium ion batteries. He, uh, he is the president and CEO of Puli Technologies, and he's also on the board of directors of Lithium America Corporation, as well as the board of advisors on Nano One and Mitchell Camp. He, gra he graduated with a BS from the University of Science and Technology of China and a PhD in physics from the University of British Columbia. So Yen, welcome. Well, thank you, Jimmy. And uh, I'm very glad to be back here. Um, just as a small correction, uh, I'm no longer CEO of Apulit. I retired in 2019, but yes, I, still, my apologies. I still on the board. I, I still sit <laughs> on the board of Apulit. Uh, but my uh, I, my spend uh, uh, about most of my time in the United States now here. Um, again, I'm wearing many hats as you introduced. I sit on the board of uh, uh, Listen Americas and also advisory board of Mitrocan and uh, Nano One, and also doing some consulting work. Uh, last year, again, very happy to be back. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, last year, I discussed mainly challenges and castle manufacturing. Um, fundamentally, my background is really a material scientist starting with uh, uh, lithium ion battery castle. But today I would like to uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, more upstream, uh, lithium supply, because that's really very, very important. Uh, as my uh, talk will show you, uh, I'll give you a little bit of flavor where lithium is coming from, how we're going to make sure we will have enough lithium to support this uh, transportation uh, revolution. Uh, and again, um, since I got short notice, I really uh, just uh, borrowed standard slides from uh, Lucent Americas. So I added, only added a few uh, geological type of a slide to make the talk a little bit more uh, colorful. So when it's uh, a more commercial, I will go faster I will spend a little bit more time on the technical aspect, uh, which I think is more interesting uh, to this audience. So first, uh, of course, this is a well-known, everybody knows that uh, I don't need to spend too much time. This is shows you the projected uh, demand for, uh, in, in terms of uh, battery uh, capacity. And the, the one thing, uh, one would notice by 2030, which is seven years from now, uh, or we can look at this 10 years from now. Either way, it would be three to four uh, terawatt hour, uh, which is a big number if you consider uh, just a few years ago how, where we were. So this is really um, the way I, I, I call it, it's the 10x growth in 10 years. So. Uh, if you translate into uh, lithium demand, again, this top line is the lithium demand. Um, again, it's about 10x. Uh, uh, I, uh, I would tell you, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, say 2030, let's, let's, let's use this as a reference point. Um, remember last slide was three terawatt hour. Here's a little more than two million tons. LCE, again, LCE stands for lithium carbonate equivalent, which is a unit used, uh, it's a convention a unit used by the industry. It's easier because most of the uh, lithium shipped to castle producer in the form of lithium carbonate and some in lithium hydroxide. So easier to use as a unit. So if you look at here, it's about a little more than 2 million tons um, versus a three terawatt hour. I want you to remember this uh, factor is really theoretical. What I have observed in the past few years, 
uh, is more of like a three, it should be three million tons versus three uh, terawatt hour, uh, watt hours because there's a lot today, there's still a lot of inefficiency. But of course, as the industry matures, uh, the inefficiency should be, uh, sh should start to disappear and then we'll get back to this uh, uh, more closer to theoretical number. But uh, what I'm trying to say, this number, if we do achieve three or four terawatt hour, this number in terms of low CM volume should be higher. But some people argue maybe it's part of the share might be taken by sodium, we don't know. So today let's just use this number that tells you where uh, the low CM demand is growing. And then down below, uh, you will see this is a, uh, this solid bar um, is really um, what the known lithium uh, producers, including their projected expansion. And then you have a highly probable and probable new project. Uh, where you see it as the years go by, there will be a, a supply gap. So that means really uh, in the solution uh, development world, people really need to put in more investment to start developing new project now, or um, come up with uh, some other ideas. Otherwise, uh, the battery industry will have a problem in terms of lithium in 10 years. Um, and again, because the, uh, the lead time for resource development pretty long, which means we will have to start doing things now, which we're, we're, we're here, in order to have enough lithium in 10 years. So uh, just a flash this slide uh, shows because of the shortage, uh, supply shortage, uh, since over a year, slightly over a year ago, we have seen a big run up in lithium prices. Uh, right now it started to soften a little bit, but how, uh, how far it will go down, we don't know. Um, a little bit uh, about um, mineralogy. Um, again, in what form a lithium are uh, being extracted today? Really, uh, if you look at the pie chart on the left, on the right is the geographical distribution. On the left is the uh, on the form of a mineral. Uh, really, I would uh, want uh, want you to to remember it's really on the uh, on the left is a hard rock type. On the right is what we have heard a lot, a brine type. And uh, again, this, uh, uh, sorry, this slide has been borrowed by, uh, from uh, Benchmark. Um, just to, uh, a note here, um, I don't know why they have small share slide here called a pegmatite because uh, spotamine, uh, lipidolite, they're all uh, forms of a pe uh, pegmatite. So they're all pegmatite. <laughs> That's what I want to say, a hard rock. But within pegmatite, the majority is spotamine. And if you look at the right, they, most of them come today come from Australia. And the other roughly half and half, uh, you would argue more than half would come from hard rock. Uh, under 50%, about half uh, come from brine sourced lithium. Uh, most of them, as you can see here, come from South America. Today, really two countries, Chile and Argentina, and some uh, from China. Uh, Western China in a province called Qinghai on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, if you look at Asia, uh, Asia has uh, every form. Uh, really here, uh, most of Lusim, when we say Asia, really means China. Uh, again, as I said, the brine source tend to be from Tibetan Plateau. Um, Spotamine in Sichuan, uh, Lepidolite from Jiangxi province. Um, Today, people are starting to pay attention to Africa, but I think still some ways to go before it can come out. In North, here in North America, this is quite a few projects in Canada. Uh, this is an interesting slide. I would like to spend some time uh, on uh, because it tells you 
um, the type of uh, resources in relation to the economics. Uh, so if you look at the, um, the y-axis, it's really operating costs. Then the, uh, the x-axis is the volume. So to the, you, if you are a developer or for the industry, for a battery industry, for the whole industry, you want to have a resource to the left, far left, as much as possible. Uh, for instance, we all have heard Atacama in Chile. Uh, here you see two players, SQM Abermarl. Uh, they give you very large volume and uh, a relatively low cost. And then as you move to the right, as industry grows, uh, we start to add uh, more supplies. The costs tend to be higher because of course, naturally people pick low hanging fruit first. Uh, so if you look at the two projects, uh, uh, Listen America's trying to develop. Uh, one is the Carcheri uh, in Argentina. Um, it will come online this year. The other one I would like to talk uh, more about it later is one right within the U.S. border. It's called Taco Pass uh, in Nevada, uh, which is here. Um, again, another, uh, here's a famous one, uh, Homo Morto, uh, uh, belonging to FMC or today called Liven. I used to work for them. Uh, so you will see the early ones tend to be to the left, a newer one. See here, as you add new supplies, especially as people start to exhaust the more desirable resources, very quickly the costs start to go up. Um, this one, this slide doesn't even, I, I don't think it include, uh, include lipidolite people are looking at. I'll address it a little bit later. The cost, um, some people argue they're around $30,000 lines here, but I, I think it's uh, a little bit harder than those uh, spotamin. Those are spotamin of Australia. So we don't know where that cost will go. Again, if you look at the number here, that calls for alarm because it's less than a million tons. Remember, I just mentioned, we need maybe 3 million tons in 10 years. Um, we'll need a lot more volume. Unless we add more volume here, uh, we're going to see the high cost of lithium more to the right. That's not what uh, battery users want to hear. So a little bit of geology, uh, where's the lithium come from? Uh, again, here, uh, it's very uh, rudimentary display of the earth. Um, you have a core, mainly of uh, iron, and, uh, and then, uh, it's, that's why we have a magnetic field. We have a huge part of the mantle, uh, which is molten rock, and we have a cross where we, uh, we stand, uh, uh, on which we stand on. Um, so listen being a very light element in this molten uh, rock, See of the motion rock, it tends to bubble up. They can be concentrated at the interface between the mantle and the crust. If if the temperature is low enough, it crystallizes. It becomes a rock over maybe the geological time, millions of years. You have extrusion. The uh, spotumin got uh, pushed out, or uh, um, then pegmatite got pushed out, then you have a, a hard rock type of a mine, or through volcanic activity, it got ejected out onto the surface, then uh, it can, uh, over the years, it got washed out into uh, uh, lakes. If lake is terminal lake, it never flow into uh, the ocean, it got concentrated at the uh, you, you got the solars. This is the case uh, in South America. Why is this uh, becoming what, what we call lithium triangle? Uh, you have probably have heard three countries, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. But actually, if you look at the map, they're very close, just happen to be in three countries. So here's a very famous uh, uh, solar uyuni, the Atacama. And here, uh, a lot of uh, development happening in Argentina. Let me zoom in. Uh, again, uh, 
Ryuni is out of screen now. Uh, the comma is here. Uh, we have heard uh, the operating one uh, uh, homo uh, myrtle by FMC, now called Liven. And here is where Listen Americas, uh, the new uh, projects be coming online to start supply uh, Kachari. And, a, uh, and also we have a few more uh, to be developed in Paso Grandes in this area. So what I want to show you is a lot of uh, uh, solars, a brand type of resources under development in Argentina. Um, so we also uh, uh, said earlier, we have another very exciting project within the US border uh, in Tarka Pass. It's the largest solution resource in the US. Uh, it's really, um, we, uh, we just got this uh, very favorable ruling in our uh, in the record of decision. So basically we got all the permit. So our first phase will be 40,000 tons. Then we'll, after that, we'll do a second phase. Now we have a total of 80,000 tons. And here, uh, I, I'll go the old slide, uh, over those slides very quickly, Argentina. You see the uh, evaporation pond, um, a, a beautiful scene. <laughs> Uh, I was just there uh, less than a month ago. And here's the really, uh, if you go there, it's two part. You have uh, a farm of evaporating pond, then you have a chemical plant. Uh, again, this is a close to 4,000 meters above sea level. Um, again, for solar, you have to be in a place with very high evaporation rate. Uh, that tend to be high altitude. Um, also, uh, the water should now flow into the sea. So you have a concentration of a lithium salt. Um, yeah, again, uh, since uh, I need to save my time here, uh, the uh, total CAPEX is about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 billion dollars. And we're coming online uh, this year. Uh, let me, um, I just mentioned just south of a Calcheri, uh, we also uh, have, uh, if you look at the map here, uh, the sort of uh, burgundy color is Paso Grandes. Uh, we own it 100% through our acquisition of Millennial Lucian over a year ago. And also we are acquiring 100% of another company called uh, Arena, uh, who own the uh, blue part of this uh, uh, big solar system. Uh, you should, uh, the deal should close pretty quick, uh, pretty soon. Um, now, I like to spend a little bit more time on North America. I just mentioned Tucker Pass, where is it? Uh, so here's uh, where you are today. Um, if you go into Nevada, you go to the north end, uh, there is a place called uh, McDermott. Uh, Tucker Pass, it's really McDermott, it's a uh, cold area uh, in, in, the, in the southern end of that basin. That's where the project is. So very good uh, infrastructure. Uh, again, a little bit to make, uh, add a few slides to, uh, to show the, uh, uh, why we have a lot of lithium there. So uh, I remember I said the lithium got brought up uh, uh, with uh, volcanic activity. So in South America, uh, in the ancient times, there's uh, uh, eruptions or hot spring, even today, some solar, in Argentina, they call it the life of solar because still house spring is still feeding lithium into the system. So as you take lithium out, more lithium still coming in, but of course the rate is very slow. So you have to wait geological time to replenish uh, the lithium coming in, but still there's a small amount of lithium coming in. Uh, so that's one form of lithium in the uh, uh, of, uh, form of solar. Here in North America, it's slightly different at the end. So uh, if you, we have probably most of us have visited Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a uh, big volcano in North, in the world probably. Uh, it, it, it erupts, every time it erupts, it poke a hole on the uh, North American plate. North American plate keep moving west. So after a few million years, that hole is west of today's active equator. So McDermott is one of the oldest crater, basically, 
as, as I was erupted 16 million years ago. A couple million years later, erupted again. So love the hole here and the hole here and the hole here. I think there's a national monument here. I think like a crater or moon uh, in Idaho. But anyway, uh, today is yellow zone, but 16 million years ago, the system, the same system was here. And again, uh, it, it, it got a loosen all over the place on the, on the rim around the crater. Over the years, last 16 million years, uh, rain washed the lithium to the bottom. You have, uh, again, the lake dried a long time ago. The old form, the lithium got absorbed uh, on the surface, very close to the surface of lake bed, uh, uh, absorbed by clays. So this is a new form of lithium. Uh, it's really not spotumin, not brine base, but very high concentration. Uh, very easy to uh, develop. Um, it's a uh, uh, spodumene, again, going back to how you develop spodumene, uh, extract lithium spodumene. Uh, spodumene is really is a lithium aluminum silicate type of a uh, thing. Uh, of course, you have to concentrate by uh, flotation, but then you have to spend a lot of energy to heat it to over a thousand degrees C to induce the phase transform uh, from, uh, from one form of silicate to another form of silicate, then you can leach it out with sulfuric acid. So here with the resource in uh, Tucker Pass, it's very, uh, the chemical bond is pretty, uh, pretty weak. You don't need to heat it up. There's no phase change required. It just, uh, you can leach it directly with sulfuric acid. Of course, you have to uh, uh, scrap it from the surface of lake bat. And also you have to do some uh, concentration. Uh, so here, this slide shows you where this resource is uh, uh, in comparison to all the known uh, resource uh, today. See, uh, remember uh, uh, Adagama uh, here and, uh, and really is one of the largest uh, in the world. Um, Oh, Adagama, uh, uh, also, I don't know why there's two, uh, Adagama is pretty big. And also, uh, so is the uh, Kachari Oloras. So we're, uh, again, if we continue to explore, we might find even more. Uh, here is a schematic uh, showing how uh, it's, uh, uh, this resource is uh, uh, extracted again. It's pretty standard. You, you, you scrape it from this uh, place and then you, you do some concentration, very standard uh, mining uh, operation. Uh, what, then you put in uh, sulfuric acid to leach it. Once you start here, the process almost the same of that of spodumene, uh, extracting lithium from spodumene, uh, which, is, which has been practiced for decades. So what I'm trying to say here and none of the uh, engineering steps on this chart is unproven or non-standard. It's all have been practiced in the past, but this resource is very unique. It would be the first of this kind for lithium extraction. Uh, <clears throat> if you are interested, you can get onto our website. There's a definitive uh, feasibility study. It will show you a lot more engineering detail uh, again, this is the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, artist uh, drawing of the plant setting. It's not big footprint. Uh, again, this is a picture of the place. Uh, if, uh, it, actually, if you stand on the top of hill here, you will see there's a huge basin. So another Yellowstone type of, a, but uh, 60 million years older than today's Yellowstone. Oh, another exciting news I'd like to mention is that uh, not too long ago, uh, we announced, or both GM and, and LAC announced a uh, strategic investment by GM, uh, 650 million into uh, this project. And again, um, we're very, very excited. I think a little bit of economic shows you, uh, uh, we're going to, with two phases, 80,000 tons, that will power more than 1 million EV per year. So some financial data. Uh, if you remember today, uh, listen price more than 40,000 tons per, uh, uh, 40, 
dollars per ton. And our economic model is based on 24. Uh, even that has given you very favorable financial returns. Um, so uh, moving forward, uh, we have, uh, again, we applied for DOE loans. So we're very excited to, to move forward uh, to develop this process uh, project. And also uh, while continuing to add capacity in our project in Argentina, in a Qatari, uh, Argentina. Then we also have new uh, resources just south of Qatari of Pastos Grandis Basin. Um, that's uh, really combines all this together. That would be a world-class lithium supplier. So here, um, I think that's the end of my talk. I would like to end my talk really back to uh, that uh, slide I used earlier. Uh, a year ago, I was here uh, calling on the industry, everyone, uh, players, try to remove all the inefficiencies in castle manufacturing. Um, as we move towards a terawatt hour, multiple million tons. Today with, uh, uh, here with this graph, I want to uh, leave your impression in order to continue to support uh, the growth of the EV, EVs, we'll need a lot more volume. Um, on this graph, we have to add more volumes here to the left uh, instead of a continuous growth of this curve. Yes, we can continue to grow this curve. For instance, lapidolite, uh, very low work rate, 0.2% versus uh, say uh, green bushes, two or 3%. That means a lot of waste rock, a lot of mining waste will be created. A lot of reagents will be, will be wasted. Uh, we will need to add more resource here uh, not just uh, uh, for sustainability, the lower cost, but also um, resource to the left tend to uh, create less waste, uh, use less region. So it's more, um, I think it's more uh, friendly practice, more sustainable practice. But again, I know we have a lot of uh, smart people in the audience. Uh, uh, a lot of geniuses sitting in the audience. How do we do that? Again, this is the example. This uh, fiber pass resource, uh, we call it a sedimentary resource. Uh, it's not, was not considered before. So some innovation is considered. Uh, and also, so innovation in geological discovery. Oh, by the way, uh, I would uh, recommend you to uh, invite uh, the chief geologist of, uh, of LAC to make a presentation here. His name is Dr. Tom Benson. Um, he's happened to be a graduate of Stanford as well. Uh, he would give you a lot more color on the new type of uh, listening resources that can I will make our world more sustainable. The other thing is the chemical engineering process development, how we um, extract lithium. Uh, I think uh, I'll call on the industry and the scientific community to think about and work hard on how we can make uh, this uh, more sustainable by bringing in more lithium here. And of course, uh, next, I don't want to steal the thunder. The other thing is recycling, but that will be a, a Professor Tarpa's talk uh, after mine. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Yeah, and thank you so much for this little for this overview of uh, lithium supply, demand, uh, and processing from uh, the various sources. Um, I, you know, this slide that you have, I believe is still up, right? Is that correct, Justin? Justin? Yes, that's right. You can stop your screen share. Oh, well, I'd, actually, let's just keep it up for a second. Yeah, and so one of the first questions I okay. have is, in this chart, uh, is there a, is one of these bars represent Lithium from brine? Oh yeah, uh, if you, uh, the very uh, famous ones are here. Uh, they're in Atacama. Uh, they're producing today by uh, SQM and uh, Albemarle and also Hobomoto by Livent. 
uh, Oloras by uh, Alcam. Those are uh, producing one. So th the one by us, LAC, will be online uh, shortly, in a few months. We'll ship out okay. our first uh, ton of Velocium this year. Okay, fantastic. So the it seems like in general, the brine uh, sources of lithium are significantly cheaper, um, but 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 they, it seems like those are uh, those are being depleted. Is that a accurate assessment of this? Um, I wouldn't call it a depleted, uh, but um, uh, 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 let me go back. Um, what well, they are they are all trying to expand. Uh, they won't deplete until maybe a few decades from now, but it's very hard to find uh, that kind of a good brine resource. Uh, in the future. Um, again, people always, when they talk about brine, they all look at the successful one. For each successful one, there'd be several, um, I, I root of some, I look at the past report, roughly every one su uh, su a successful one, like three or four fail. <laughs> and uh, you, you're not gonna have more as, uh, as shown uh, in that map, not too many known resources. So, Really, and the uh, um, there are limit. I, I think expansion, more volume, is very difficult. Uh, one of the things, if you remember, um, to oh, I forgot to mention, to make a lithium carbonate, you need a lot of uh, fresh water. Yeah. Uh, because uh, then, brine resource, a good brine resource, tend to occur in places very dry. So there's the lemma. If it's now dry, you're not going to have a big salar. Um, but you do need a lot of fresh water. So it's, it, it limit, uh, it's a, uh, so the production capacities tend to be limited by the availability of fresh water. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, developers today start to recycle water, but still there's some limitation. And again, if you look at the, the gr uh, green bushes, this telosin, this is one example for spot mean, uh, hard rock type of a lucian resource, uh, cost is higher, Actually, this is lower cost of a, a rock, uh, a hard rock, because you have a lot of, uh, Pill Bar is another famous one, uh, spotum in, in Australia. See the difference in cost. Um, most of the cost increases because energy required um, to, uh, to crack spotum in, but also mm -hmm. uh, depending on work rate and the location of the, uh, of the pit, it can, you might need to move a lot of a, what's they call overburden, a lot of rock on the, on the top to develop that resource. Right? So the cost difference can be so different. So brine resource, you don't need to move all this rock. And for target pass, you, again, it's on the surface. Uh, it's so much easier to, uh, to extract. Right. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so the other question uh, really is on this very exciting project you have in Thatcher Pass. And, um, my question revolves around there is a um, there is a lot of activity right now on um, installing battery manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, driven by a number of things, and I was just wondering, uh, you know, with these new with these new bills like uh, the infrastructure bill or the IRA, is this part of the bills that are now making Thatcher Pass and domestic production of lithium attractive? Uh, definitely, a a a a it make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. And do you see then that this trend will also continue? That other uh, available sources of lithium in the U.S. are going to start to be new projects are going to go going to start coming online in the years ahead. Uh, I I think so. Uh, I think in that aspect, not just the U.S., say uh, Canada, uh, in North America, I think it will become very attractive. Um, so I think it, it does make a difference. Yeah, and I was really excited to, well, I, I guess uh, excited, but also a little surprised that you got permitted. Uh, new mines within uh, the U.S. seems to be uh, a challenge. And uh, you, can you always, describe a little bit about that? Yeah, it's been always. That's, that's the thing. If we want to enhance our national security, we emphasize on using domestic supply uh, to support our EV industry, then uh, people need to be more supportive to mining. So you can have both. Um, and uh, I think in the past, uh, mining has been not 
put in a more favorable light. So, but but it then that's why we see a lot of the minerals uh, coming from uh, overseas. But now, if if it is important uh, to get a mineral uh, at home, then I think the attitude. Uh, by the way, the mining practice has improved so much in the last two decades. And I actually learned, again, I'm a physicist. I just learned about this uh, through my career in the past, uh, say, 15 years. Um, really, the mining practice is completely different. I think the general public tend to have a uh, old impression of mining. Today, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, tailings, how you tr treat the waste, how you treat uh, things and the community relations and all things, very different. So with, because of the uh, tougher regulation in this country. So I think the mining has improved quite a bit. It's different uh, type of mining as we we saw when we were small. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and and I can, I can certainly attest to the fact that the public impression sometimes is on technologies which are much older and the advances in that uh, have really, you know, uh, I think we really, uh, there are a lot of people that are not aware of this, and it's a different story. Um, thinking about locally, especially around California, there's a lot of media around potentially the Salton Sea, and I was curious if you're if you have any thoughts on that, and uh, um, on you know, especially in California, the Salton Sea in, in Southern California. Yeah, it's a geothermal. Actually, in fact, I happen to be. Uh, um... I wouldn't call it directly involved, but uh, I, I was uh, indirectly involved with that uh, more than uh, how many years ago? Um, 13 years ago. Uh, yes, the geothermal resource. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting because the, the, uh, the brine underground contains some, if I remember correctly, 100 ppm. It's not much. Uh, so you, uh, you need that uh, hot brine to generate electricity. So the idea is that you, you add a filter, you can capture lithium, but uh, theoretically, uh, but the challenge is the, you, because the concentration is so low, so you have a huge volume go through your filter, that creates a lot of challenges. Um, uh, but I, I'm sure that some smart people are working on that. <laughs> they can, they, they would be, because it's a challenge is a huge volume. So when yeah. you have a huge volume, even a small, small percentage, something, see particularly, that can cause problem to your filter. And then I hope that it could be, once it's got solved, uh, that become very attractive and viable. And because on the paper, it's so, it's a, you have to pump up the brine for, uh, for power generation anyway. <laughs> it's hot already. <laughs> oh, interesting. You just need to so, capture. Uh, yeah, oh, also let me add, mining in this country, even mining in California is possible. The, uh, the example is that the uh, uh, Mountain Pass Rare Earth Mine in California. I used to work for Molecore. I used to visit that mine once a month uh, between 2010 and 2014. If you come uh, operate a mine, that's a Rare Earth Mine, which is a little bit more challenging than Lucy Mine, right. uh, then I think you, there's no problem operating other uh, Lucy Mine in California. Yeah, you know, I, I think certainly uh, I've uh, heard from a number of uh, um, people I've talked to that uh, one of the big challenges we need now is uh, arguably uh, uh, permit reform because uh, you know you may have the money, but the process of permitting right now is a big is a big challenge. And so I was yep. very happy to hear that, in fact, even in the case of the mining for the statue, that you know it actually was approved, and so that uh, things are actually moving. Yeah, so uh, let's go ahead. And... Also, also uh, the, the federal judge uh, made a ruling as in favor of us when it's a challenge. So yeah. that's really, really good. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, let's turn to a, a couple of questions from our audience. So um, one of the questions is, does the lithium quality vary between plants, extraction sites, countries, et cetera? Um, I, I would say uh, the simple answer is that the input, the feed, is very different. Yeah. But uh, the customer would not care uh, where the lotion is from. They give you the same spec. So yeah. let's say you have a, a terrible feed. Then you just need to spend more money, have more equipment, 
to purify it to customer spec. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so the another question from the audience is, audience is do you think cathode or anode chemistry uh, has more room for changing in terms of reducing lithium demand? Um, really, today, in today's lithium ion battery design, all the lithium comes from cathode. So anode really has nothing. Uh, well, uh, I, I know, uh, sorry, I take my word back. Anode has a bearing. If you anode consume a lot of lithium during right. the first charge, your reversible yeah. capacity, you waste the lithium. So it does have bearing. But in terms of uh, cathode, yes, uh, the, uh, the lithium loadings um, are different. Uh, for instance, the famous uh, layered oxide compound, a lot of lithium serves as a pillar. So the lithium will never, they, they're in the, as a pillar between the layers, it will never come out. So that's a dead lithium too. So say uh, lithium iron phosphate, all the lithium will come out. Then you don't have, uh, theoretically, you have no lithium wasted by design. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a solid state lithium battery, the lithium coming in form of uh, lithium metal. If you can reduce the uh, uh, passivation loss, then you reduce the lithium loading. Otherwise, you have to, uh, let's say theoretically, you need to 100 grams, you might have to load to 200 grams because you have to right. compensate on the passivation loss. So, right. yeah. Uh, there's a work to be done to reduce the lithium usage for the same watt hour. Fantastic. Uh, it's so great to see and understand some of the advances that are being made <clears throat> to supply lithium uh, as we undergo this enormous ramp uh, in the years ahead. And um, um, it's, uh, it's also very interesting to see how, uh, you know, you, in, the in the chart that you show showing the spot price, how the market softened within the last four to five months. It seems to be extremely volatile, uh, given uh, uh, given right now the uh, the softness of the market or changes, especially in the couple of years ahead. That's just my general sense right now that there's going to be incredible volatility as everything sort of settles. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I don't have a crystal ball, but... Um... Uh, we do, uh, the fact is fact, we, we have seen a softening, uh, but again, that's mostly driven by demand softening. Right. Uh, we have to look at the data. Uh, EV sales, unfortunately, slowed down since uh, uh, November, December. Uh, it's not only in the US, in China as well, globally. So that's the main factor. Right. Uh, it's not because all of a sudden we, we find another Atagama. Uh, a big, big supply. Uh, right. Supply continue to lag behind demand. So if that trend continues, uh, I, I would think the softening will be temporary. But however, right. the biggest uh, factor we need to watch is the uh, demand. If, if EV growth continue on its course, uh, I would think this price softening would be temporary. But of course, if people all of a sudden say, hey, uh, I... If the DV, EV growth delayed by a couple of years, then the price will continue to come down. Yeah, and, and you know, certainly here in California, we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, we're seeing a a demand that's in for EVs much greater than supply <laughs> uh, for yeah. for a number yeah. of supply chain issues, not just uh, you know, uh, yeah. certainly not lithium, but uh, that's one thing that we are observing, and we're starting to see that, um, uh, you know, literally uh, right now the the price we pay for EVs in California exceed the MSRP, you know, mm -hmm. by by about ten percent, and that's the norm. At least it's been that way for the last year. So uh, we uh, we expect that that uh, that will change as the uh, number of EVs become more available. But it's great to see that that happening right now. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, John, for that uh, presentation, and uh, we'll have. Uh, We'll have Will Tarpe speak next, and then we'll bring both of you back uh, for questions. So, uh, fantastic. So, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Will Tarpe, uh, a, an assistant professor uh, here at Stanford. Um, the Tarpe, the Tar, excuse me, the Tarpe group develops and evaluates selective separations in wastewater at several synergistic, at several synergistic, sorry, at several synergistic scales. 
Um, and Will got his BS in chemical engineering here at Stanford and his MS and PhD in environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. And Will recently was honored as one of Forbes 30 under 30 in 2019 in the area of environmental science and technology. So welcome, Will, and we look forward to your talk on recycling. Wonderful. Thank you, Jimmy. And um, thanks to the StorageX team for putting on this uh, symposium. Um, it's great to uh, speak uh, right after uh, Yuan. Uh, we've met before at a StorageX panel, and so we were excited to kind of put this two-part story together. So um, I'm going to focus on the recycling part of lithium batteries, which is um, certainly an uh, exciting and burgeoning uh, field, and try to introduce um, everyone here to some novel materials and processes um, that are underway in terms of being able to recycle uh, lithium batteries. Um, I'm going to focus today on uh, recycling from directly from uh, lithium ion batteries, but some of these approaches can also be used for improved extraction from uh, brines and other sources. So Jan has covered this, so I'll just have one slide on it, but um, clearly there's a large demand and increasing demand for lithium, and our uh, reserves aren't quite up uh, to uh, the challenge. Now, of course, um, we will uh, improve our, qual our quality of reserves through innovation and more extraction, but we're also able to potentially solve both a discharge and a manufacturing problem by actually recycling lithium ion batteries. So in the US, the vast majority of lithium ion batteries are not uh, actually uh, recycled. They end up in the landfill, in landfills, um, and only a small percentage are co-processed with other uh, metals where separation techniques uh, to turn these back into uh, high purity uh, metals are underway. Using recycled materials from these spent batteries could, of course, it, uh, decrease costs, energy use, and water use, and we'll dig into especially those environmental impacts, energy and water, as well as emissions later in this talk. And there's uh, an increasing opportunity to actually uh, make uh, revenue, uh, generate revenue from recycling lithium ion batteries uh, with roughly a fourfold increase expected over the next uh, now two years or so. So the vast majority of the growth in lithium ion battery production, of course, has been for electric vehicles, but there's also a sizable portion of this for uh, non-electric vehicles as well. The Department of Energy has been um, really behind increasing a, a U.S. Uh, lithium supply, a U.S.-based domestic uh, lithium supply. And so one way to think about this for me as a separations person is if I'm trying to uh, recover some valuable product, I start to think about where is that uh, species most concentrated. So to flip that around, you could say, okay, how much of different sources do I need to produce one ton of battery grade lithium? And so you can see that for lithium ion battery waste, we're an order of magnitude uh, more concentrated in lithium more or less than traditional um, approaches like ore and brine, traditional feedstocks. And so one of the things that uh, we've done through StorageX, this is how my group got into this uh, work through a seed fund, a, a seed grant uh, from StorageX, and this is in collaboration with Professor Sally Benson and uh, Professor Inez Acevedo, both of whom are in the Energy Sciences Engineering uh, Department, Energy Science and Engineering Department in the new Stanford Door School for Sustainability. We got together and said, okay, let's try to compare in as side-by-side -side a way as possible, conventional and circular supply chains of lithium production. So uh, in this kind of block flow diagram on the left, you can see tracing through three major steps here, extraction, logistics, and refinement, those all caps words, and then uh, going through two different pathways. In the conventional case, what Jan just stepped through, there's natural mining, you uh, extract and make some concentrate. That concentrate is transported from the extraction location to a refining location that may be uh, several thousand miles away. Those materials are refined into battery precursor materials. So the circular case, and of course this doesn't quite exist at the same scale as the conventional case right now, is to collect spent or wasted uh, lithium ion batteries. That's the equivalent of the natural mining. When we have those together aggregated, we need to transport them just like we would transport the conventional concentrate. And then rather than a, a refinery, we have a different type of refinery or recycling facility where the output of both the conventional and circular case is battery precursor materials that then go through the battery manufacturing process. Now you can imagine doing this for a whole battery, but of course, as we know, battery chemistries vary. This came up during the discussion after Jan's talk. And also 
uh, there are different elements that uh, we'll need to consider. And so these types of scorecards, the text is intentionally small because I'm more introducing you to the idea, but you can see this is for lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, aluminum, and copper. And what we did was sort of track what are the top three places where each element is mined, the top three places where each element is refined, and the top three uh, places that manufacture batteries that contain that element. Then we, we looked at where the top reserves are. So of course, there's large concentrations of lithium in Australia and in uh, South America. And then we looked at the composition of typical battery packs and also where those EV batteries are being consumed. So what this gave us a sense was, is what's the kind of average, if you will, distance traveled by an amount of any one of these elements as it goes from mining all the way to EV battery production. And so you can see all of these are on the order of thousands of kilometers from the mine to the consumer per atom. And so the um, potential here is that by being more circular, we might be able to decrease this transport distance as it will. And with that, decrease all of the emissions and uh, costs that are associated with that transport. So to dig into this first, we started thinking about from a systems level, um, how would we evaluate some of these environmental impacts of recycling lithium ion batteries? And so we did this by focusing on two common formulations, NCA and NMC, uh, the stoichiometry shown here. And um, we wanted to normalize all of those um, descriptors of our process by the weight of one kilogram of battery active material. And so we also thought about this from uh, an elemental standpoint. And so you could think about it as, as the weight of each element given the composition as shown here on this graphic. So to take a step back before we uh, dig into comparing uh, our life cycle to doing our, um, showing you the results from our life cycle assessment of a, of a novel uh, recycling process developed by um, Redwood Materials in Nevada here in the US. I want to sort of just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of uh, what state of the art is in lithium recycling today. So the two major approaches for lithium battery recycling are pyrometallurgy, uh, using temperature as a driving force, and hydrometallurgy, um, in short, using pH as a driving force. And so in pyrometallurgy, we're basically um, heating the, uh, the battery components up uh, until we make uh, some type of slag phase and then we're able uh, to recover some of those metals downstream. Now, some of the advantages here are that it's been well developed, so it's feasible at large scale, and you don't need to add uh, as many chemical reagents, especially um, uh, strong acids and strong bases. Disadvantages, of course, include everything associated with temperature-driven separations, which are well known in chemical manufacturing, to contribute a disproportionate amount of environmental impacts. And so in separations, a lot of our work, broadly speaking, in this field is to uh, reduce the extreme temperatures and extreme pressures that are required uh, for high purity materials. So the second uh, big category of recycling methods is hydrometallurgy, where we're using aqueous solutions that tend to be uh, acidic in nature to uh, achieve high recovery and high product purity. The challenge is that we end up polluting a lot of water. In the lithium recovery rate, uh, there's basically large error bars on what a uh, recovery rate can be accomplished. Now, the third uh, type of uh, battery recycling that's uh, sort of increasing in scale, um, but is certainly not at the level of hydro and pyrometallurgical approaches, is direct cathode recycling, where rather than decomposing the cathode into substituent elements, uh, we're trying to recycle the whole uh, cathode, as it were, uh, through, um, uh, through uh, solvent extraction, potentially. And so uh, with this life cycle analysis, our goal was to uh, address the fact that even the three recycling methods I just showed you are relatively limited. And so uh, this ties back into extraction methods being decades old, which is not a bad thing. They work for the constraints they were developed in, but recycling has uh, different constraints uh, than um, uh, extraction uh, from naturally occurring uh, mineral deposits, for example. So our, our goal was to uh, expand the, the depth of knowledge we have about current recycling methods, in particular in terms of their environmental impacts. Um, and this is very interesting because through a lot of our meetings through the StorageX uh, consortium, we we're able to chat with um, battery manufacturers and battery recyclers who are increasingly uh, establishing pilot plants and sometimes demonstration plants. And they're, they're often limited uh, to um, kind of taking technologies that have been developed for other 
uh, approaches like for extraction and trying to piece together a recycling plant. And so our goal here was to try to give a little more guidance to those decisions of which technology and which uh, combinations of technologies would minimize uh, some of the environmental impacts. And so here we did this gate to gate environmental assessment comparing conventional refinement uh, to uh, a lithium ion battery recycling. So to zoom all the way out, you can think about this as just feedstocks and consumables, think energy, water, et cetera, going in uh, to this process at Redwood Materials. And then what comes out is our product outputs, our battery precursor materials, and of course the output emissions. And so to bring it back to this uh, block flow diagram, we're zooming in and when we say gate to gate, we just mean at the refinery or recycling facility. So ignore everything upstream and downstream, just focus on what's highlighted in red here. And then we're also able uh, to do the cradle to gate, which is the full, uh, the full um, process flow here from extraction all the way to refinement. And so again, we can think of those three big steps in CAPS, extraction, transport, refinement, where gate to gate is focused on just the refinement step and uh, cradle to gate is all three extraction plus transport plus refinement. So some of our findings here, Redwood has a um, uh, like we mentioned, uh, uh, an adapted uh, process, a novel process that combines some elements of hydrometallurgy with some elements of pyrometallurgy. And so the, the details aren't really critical to this assessment, um, but we can, we can dig into the, the uh, results and some of the key conclusions here. So I'll orient you to this graph, which is for energy, and then I'll show you uh, two similar graphs for water input and greenhouse gas emissions. So here we're looking at energy on the y-axis and there are uh, four bars. So the first one is the conventional mine and that is normalized. Uh, uh, you can look at the whole bar, but you can also look at the uh, constituent parts for each element. Uh, and then we can look at uh, uh, recycled batteries. And so in the first uh, recycled case, we can look at mechanical uh, plus hydrometallurgical approaches. And that's for a charged battery that you need to discharge first before you recycle it. So this is with conventional approaches. Then we can cross that dotted line and make the comparison of the reductive calcination approach plus uh, um, uh, mechanical and uh, hydrometallurgical approaches. And then we could compare that uh, to just mechanical and hydrometallurgical, uh, but with recycled scrap. So we can compare the middle two bars for the same feedstock recycled battery and look at the effect of the reductive calcination approach. And then we can compare the uh, third and the fourth bar uh, to compare the effect of a uh, recycled scrap uh, versus uh, uh, recycled batteries. So we can see that we're getting really big drops here in terms of energy uh, consumption. And similar stories here for CO2 equivalent emissions. So that's all the greenhouse gases normalized uh, as if they were CO2, and then for water consumption as well. And so this is our, our kind of take on an apples to apples comparison as much as possible of conventional refinement with recycled, with several different recycled battery uh, process flow diagrams. And so we can see that of course, if you don't have to discharge the battery, you can just take scrap off of the manufacturing floor as it were, our, your environmental impacts will be quite low. But even if you have recycled batteries with this reductive um, uh, calcination process, you can actually get close to the environmental impacts of recycling um, scrap, but for recycled batteries. So one of the key, another of the key insights from um, this study that we performed was the fact that where you get your electricity will of course influence your environmental impacts. And so that's not necessarily a novel insight, but quantifying it in the context of battery recycling certainly is. And so what this brings to mind, one way you can think about this is where you put your recycling facility really matters in terms of the environmental comparisons, uh, the results of those environmental comparisons. So here we have several different uh, electricity grids and around the US. And so the um, CISO is the one in California where we are and uh, Redwood is located in the NEVP uh, uh, grid that's shown here. And so we included some others as well, just for comparison. And so you'll see when I say where your electricity comes from, I mean, what mixture of sources you have. So in the CISO case, we have a lot of uh, renewables um, associated with the electricity grid here in the Bay Area and in Nevada uh, for the um, NEVP is what the standard is. But uh, actually this analysis kind of informed Redwood, uh, a decision by Redwood to move towards this, uh, paying a premium for this renewable energy because it drastically lowers the environmental impacts. And so we can take a closer look at why our, our conclusions are so sensitive to electricity mix by simply looking at the contribution to the environmental impacts along these different refinement pathways. So lots of colors here, but suffice it to say that these are the different uh, 
inputs you need uh, throughout the whole process flow diagram um, in the Redwood facility. And so the biggest takeaway you can see is the red bars are the largest, and that's exactly the electricity input. So that's exactly why we're so sensitive to electricity source. So in short, electricity contributes the majority of environmental impacts, energy, CO2 emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and water input. So thus, the environmental impacts of the electricity that's provided will play a large role in what we see for the overall process. So we can take a closer look at that, looking on the x-axis here at different electricity sources or electricity mixes and looking at CO2 equivalent emissions and water consumption on the top and bottom, respectively. And so we can see this um, uh, comparing to the, um, uh, the red, which is the uh, conventional case. And so then we can see that some of these approaches, uh, are they all uh, experience lower emissions here, but what we get is a trade-off with water. And so this is because the, uh, the NV star uh, uses a lot of geothermal uh, power. And so what that means is that even though the emissions are low, you're, you're consuming uh, more water. And so again, this just establishes that in any life cycle assessment, we're not so much after like what's the optimal answer, but just establishing those trade-offs so that decision makers and stakeholders can say, okay, which is more important to me? Is it the emissions or the water consumption? And establishing that there is indeed a trade-off. So that's sort of some of the work on how we're evaluating this at a systems level scale. Now I want to dig into some of our more bench scale, molecular scale work on developing novel materials for selective lithium extraction. So to sort of set the stage here, I want to, again, uh, go back to what's the state of the art for uh, lithium selective uh, materials that can achieve actually extraction of lithium from complex aqueous waste streams. So you can think about this as downstream of a hydrometallurgical process. What you'll get is an, uh, an aqueous stream that has many different metals in it. And our challenge is how do we select just lithium out of that mixture of metal ions uh, in an aqueous stream. So uh, to date, many people have focused on ion exchange membranes or IEMs. And so uh, these are, of course, used in many different systems like electrolyzers, uh, aqueous batteries, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, NAFION would be an example of this as well, which uh, many of us are familiar with. So these have fixed charge uh, functional groups that allow transport of oppositely charged counter ions while rejecting like charged co ions. So, to take some of that jargon away, what I mean is that if we're looking at a cation exchange membrane, it's called that because it lets cations through, but it itself, the membrane, is negatively charged so that it lets cations through but repels anions. And so, um, these ion exchange membranes to date are quite selective in terms of charge, right? We can discriminate between positively charged ions and between negatively charged ions with some success. Now, the uh, challenge, the ongoing challenges here are that we can, within like charged molecules, so within cations, we can do a pretty good job of separating mono versus multivalent ions. So separating lithium from magnesium, for example, or calcium with a selectivity value on the order of uh, five to 10. But what the, what the real challenge is right now, the state of the art here, is can we separate monovalent like charged species from each other? So lithium from uh, something like chloride, no problem. We're doing that already, commercial membrane. Lithium from magnesium or calcium with the valent different, valence difference, we're doing pretty well. But lithium from sodium, those have similar charges and they're both positive. Um, and so there's the real challenge and what we're after. So one of the first things uh, we did was just look at lithium selectivity and lithium flux or related to permeability for a series of different commercial membranes. We wanted to see what's our baseline right now on the market for lithium selectivity. So let's look at this bottom graph first. You have lithium selectivity on this uh, Y axis on a log scale. And then we have several different membranes, uh, reverse osmosis membranes, nanofiltration, anion and cation exchange membranes. And so uh, these circles are for lithium versus different uh, ion selectivity. So a selectivity of one means you're not really able to separate uh, the two ions at all. Uh, so the more extreme, either higher or lower, <clears throat> the better. And so here we can see that the lithium to sodium uh, selectivity is indeed just about one for all the ions we tried, all the membranes we tried uh, specifically, and particularly the cation exchange membranes. But the lithium to divalent uh, cations is can get above 10. So we're uh, just establishing what we're seeing uh, kind of with commercial materials. Now the lithium flux here doesn't vary much uh, beyond the, the uh, kind of a one and a half order of magnitude estimate here. So the, the selectivity is really what we're after here uh, to distinguish ourselves. And so state of the art membranes here as, as uh, we and others have started to think about lithium selective extractions 
You can think about adding coordination chemistry to achieve not just physical separation based on size, but chemical separation based on affinity to ligands that are in the membrane matrix. <clears throat> and so here, uh, we and others have explored uh, different types of ligands that have inner sphere coordinations with lithium. So you could think aminodiacetate for uh, copper, people have looked at crown ethers for potassium and lithium, and also for cesium and sodium. But the challenge here is that you might, we need to tease apart the effects of these ligands on getting the ion into the membrane and also transporting that ion across the membrane. And so we, we talk about that as partitioning, which is getting the ion into the membrane out of the water, and then being able to actually get diffusion or migration through the membrane. And so that's where we start to see trade-offs here between permeability and selectivity as shown here in this uh, bottom graph with work by uh, Chris Bates and Benny Freeman and others. And so as we see it, there are some key research areas of opportunity here where for membrane materials trying to achieve monovalent monovalent selectivity, we can focus on a charge ligand grafted membrane. So that gives us both charge and chemical affinity as um, selectivity uh, measures, measures towards achieving selectivity. We can also focus on process design here, and so design new processes in addition to the conventional pressure driven like reverse osmosis and electrodialysis, so we can combine multiple driving forces uh, to achieve selective separations. And then we're really excited about digging into some of these transport mechanisms from a more fundamental perspective, so that this enhanced mechanistic insight helps us design next generation uh, membranes as well. So as an example, we can think about something like ligand grafting density, which we're really interested in right now, where you might imagine uh, it's not immediately apparent whether you want a very high ligand grafting density or a very low one. If you have a very high one, you might say, oh, that will allow me to achieve migration through my membrane, but it might also increase the chances that your lithium ion gets stuck in the membrane and simply sorbed rather than transported. So these are some of the questions we're looking at um, from both the molecular dynamics approach through collaborations and from an experimental screening approach as well. So in terms of designing um, these membranes, again, what we're trying to achieve is lithium going through and other ions being rejected. And so these molecular level design uh, degrees of freedom we have are things like size, uh, separating based on size, based on the pore size of the membrane, which we can control during synthesis, charge, valency, and then this ligand affinity as well. So what this looks like for us uh, in two uh, of our key approaches, first, is using a ligand enhanced nanoporous membrane for lithium and magnesium separations. So taking a nanoporous membrane that we can apply an electrodialytic uh, setup and adding ligands like a simple carboxylic acid that will interact with lithium and allow it to transport through the membrane, but reject something uh, like magnesium using an aromatic polyamide membrane. We're also in collaboration with Professor Yan Xia, who's in chemistry here at Stanford. And this is through another um, initiative uh, funded by StorageX, we're looking at actually counterintuitively using a positively charged membrane that is ligand functionalized such that positive um, cations like sodium are rejected based on the charge uh, repelling. Um, uh, but uh, uh, ions like lithium can make their way through to overcome that, re that uh, repelling effect uh, of the like charge of the lithium and the positively charged membrane. So in short, we're trying to use anion exchange membranes to transport cations, which sounds like an uphill battle and is but is one that we can um, uh, potentially scale uh, by uh, controlling the ligands uh, that are in the membrane. <clears throat> so what does this look like in the lab? Actually, we're fabricating a library of ligand functionalized membranes, starting with acrylic acid as a key um, uh, ligand and going through this process of uh, uh, preparing monomers, then irradiating this pre-polymer film with UV light and making membrane coupons that we characterize in a variety of ways. So the monomers we can look at uh, via NMR uh, to make sure we uh, we have what we intend to make. And then for the membrane coupons, we're looking at kind of three different groups of tests. So for mechanical testing, uh, IR spectroscopy, elemental analysis, water uptake, and ion exchange capacity. And then that the last two are about that partitioning, the, uh, the sorption tests, and also about the transport of the ions, these diffusion tests. So this is definitely a, a trial and error approach, and we're trying to rapidly upscale the number of membranes we can uh, screen, uh, but we have some uh, promising results that are uh, coming up now. So a couple insights into uh, deeper dives into um, what I mean by uh, generating these membranes. And give me one second, I'm just getting a, okay, there we are. Um, uh, we can use uh, FTIR, like I mentioned, to look at membrane composition. And so we can control the percentage or the weight loading, if you will, 
of acrylic acid uh, here and start to see, of course, in FTIR, uh, uh, larger peaks associated with uh, moieties associated with acrylic acid. So the C double bond O, the CO and the OH uh, peaks kind of increase as we add more acrylic acid, which is no surprise. Uh, another thing uh, that we're doing is actually testing the membrane performance in diffusion experiments. And so here what we can do is uh, we've 3D printed these uh, cells that we clip together. So the membrane is right between these circles where that red clip is keeping things together. And we can just track over time how um, much of each ion, lithium or nickel in this case, goes from feed to permeate. And what's in that permeate is just nano pure water. And so by tracking the lithium and uh, nickel transport, we can start to uh, observe uh, potential selectivity. So the flux is going to be related to the concentration um, change over time, normalized to volume and area. And this, this partitioning coefficient we can calculate as well. So you can see from this example, we're starting to achieve some lithium selective uh, separations, but not quite uh, there yet. But this gives you an example of the type of data uh, that we're collecting from these experiments. So I wanted to wrap up with some thoughts about um, <clears throat> that's both that are both uh, concentrated on materials and processes for lithium recycling and step out of the membrane um, way of uh, thinking and look at adsorbents as well. So adsorbents are very typical in water treatment as a way to remove uh, key pollutants from uh, different uh, aqueous streams. And so lithium is naturally a good candidate uh, for potential uh, removal and recovery uh, in a selective nature uh, via adsorption. So here what we have is uh, many different uh, or many identical uh, beads, ion exchange resin beads that will attract lithium and other cations. The key insight that we're bringing to this is using electrochemistry to regenerate these ion exchange resins. And this is based on some of our other work on other ions and other wastewaters actually, but showing that one of the Achilles heels in terms of environmental impacts of adsorption is actually the regeneration process. And so having to add concentrated acid or base can really dominate the, um, the CO2 emissions and the energy input required from a life cycle perspective for adsorption. So we've been looking at using electrochemistry and simple water splitting to basically generate on-site acid and base um, using uh, renewable electrons to then desorb and regenerate this resin and in the process actually make concentrated lithium solutions. And so from um, we've been thinking about this for geothermal brines, and so you can see here the challenge is that lithium is at very low concentrations compared to its competitor uh, cations. And so if we um, look first at just commercial resins, we see that there's not really lithium selective commercial resins yet. And so the, in fact, these are uh, lithium anti-selective, if you will. Lithium is the least, uh, has the lowest affinity uh, for these adsorption sites. And, um, and so if we look at, uh, look at the selectivity, that selectivity is below one. And, but that's only the selectivity of the adsorption step. And many um, adsorption developers would stop there and say, okay, let's move on to the next adsorbent because we can't really work with this. It doesn't uh, uh, adsorb enough lithium. It only adsorbs less than 40% of lithium compared to 100% of these divalent cations. But the key insight we're taking here is that adsorption is only one lever you have to control selectivity of your overall process. The other that's less engineered and less understood is the desorption part. So what we've done is actually use electrochemical regeneration to achieve selectivity even with this unselective adsorption on commercial resins. So to step through that, we can look at the recovery of different cations over time. And in every horizontal line you're seeing, that's the amount that was adsorbed. And so you can think about the percentage of the recovery as what you see in the dots over time relative to the horizontal line. So in short, lithium is where you get the dots closest to the line. And so you've gotten most of the lithium off relative versus getting almost none of the magnesium and calcium off of the resin. And so we can get nearly complete regeneration of lithium with zero divalence. And we can get uh, in the first 20 minutes, we can actually get a lithium over other cations, so sodium and potassium here, selectivity of 25. Now, if you remember from the membranes, 3 to 15 was a good for lithium versus divalent cations, and the lithium versus the sodium and potassium was only one. So we're able to get quite a selective desorption process here, and this is even higher than if we just add, ma add acid manually because we're sort of dosing the acid because it's being generated in the same place as the desorption is occurring. And so this means multiply the 25 times the 0.1 and we can get an overall lithium selectivity of 2.5 for a commercial resin. Again, this is not that much higher than one, but you can start to see that if we are able to develop a resin and adsorbent that is lithium selective and combine this with this electrochemical regeneration that is also lithium selective, we can really start to improve the selectivity of the overall process. 
So what does this look like kind of overall to zoom out? We're really interested in comparing different technologies and sorbents, membranes, solvent extraction as well to, to determine what are the cost and environmental benefits of uh, different approaches, especially when you think about putting technologies in series rather than just comparing them in parallel. So we can aggregate some of these metrics and the literature is quite heterogeneous in terms of what it reports. And one of the big outcomes we want of this work is to define and compute some unifying metrics that are comparable for productivity or throughput selectivity and also specific energy. Map some of these technologies to applications like lithium ion battery waste as well as geothermal brines, and then uh, construct some life cycle and techno-economic models that will help us uh, be able to adapt to specific case studies that will hopefully be of a lot of use uh, for industry uh, and for academics as we move forward in lithium recycling. So to summarize, uh, in our group, we're focused on a few uh, different aspects of lithium recycling in addition to the systems level assessment you're seeing at the bottom here, comparing metals and process performance. We're developing and characterizing membranes and adsorbents uh, for selected lithium recovery. I wanted to stop with just a quick highlight of some of the uh, work at Stanford that our students have uh, been engaging in. So uh, last year, we were able to host a battery recycling day in partnership with Redwood. So uh, this is Michael pictured here, who's a, a postdoc, who as a former postdoc is now uh, at uh, Toyota Research Institute. And uh, Sam uh, pictured here is one of my PhD students. And they really uh, led this uh, process along with StorageX to collect batteries all across campus. We had staff, faculty, students all um, uh, uh, returning disposed batteries, and then these went straight to Redwood to their uh, process, and it was also a great educational opportunity. So one of the beautiful things about working on a university campus is connecting the research with the education, so just wanted to highlight that as well. And with that, I'll acknowledge my group members and also want to acknowledge our collaborators as well, the Benson Labs, uh, the Acevedo Lab, and our collaborators at Redwood Materials, and more than happy to answer questions and looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you so much to uh, a, 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 a snapshot of all the areas that you're working on. It's very exciting. It's actually, you know, I, I see all this activity and all this learning and uh, creativity on top of that. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. I just wanted to pass along some of my thoughts on that. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, so we'll start at the highest level. Um, looking at the systems analysis, uh, you just discuss a lot about the process and just uh, do you have any insight into how uh, the collection uh, and how the transportation of the batteries, how they, they play a role in this whole recycling value chain? Yeah, that's a good question, Jimmy. So um, <clears throat> I left that um, graph out just for brevity today, but um, what it comes down to is that in the conventional case, the uh, those steps, the extraction and the transport actually um, they don't play as large a role because the refining itself is yeah. a bigger part of the bar. But in the recycling case, when you decrease the, the size of the, of the refining bar, if you will, then actually the transport and the, ex, the aggregation of the batteries play a larger share because we've decreased the refinement. And so that's when then actually there's a lot of work that can go into. And we did some kind of preliminary modeling of, okay, say we have this many batteries in California and you... Um, collect them in this way, What are how, how would you minimize some of those environmental impacts? So I think speaks to the larger question of, um, which I think is a fun part, but could be an overwhelming part of these approaches, which is like, yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you do better on one, one, uh, one contributor, if you will, the refining part, then it exposes that you need to do better on the other parts, right? But I think that's kind of actually how we get down to minimizing environmental impacts. It's this iterative circular approach to closing the loop on closing the loop. Yeah, fantastic, you know, and, do you have a sense, um, just uh, roughly in, in a relative manner, how the uh, the cost of, say, the uh, collection and transport compared to the cost that you're seeing in the process portion? Are they bigger, you know, or are they actually comparable or smaller? Yeah, that's something we don't have a sense for yet. We um, Early on, we decided to focus on environmental impacts first and then bring in um, cost. And so we haven't, we haven't gotten um, kind of high quality cost data um, yet. Um, and I think that would take some more collaboration with some other industry partners who might be focused on pilot scale treatment as well, but definitely an open, open question. And um, we have some colleagues in the business school who are interested in um, supply chains and how to minimize the costs as well, the business school here at Stanford. And so definitely an open, open question as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, one of the reasons uh, it was so exciting to work with your students on the collection part of it, besides their overwhelming enthusiasm and passion, was that uh, 
really understanding uh, the psychology behaviors of, uh, and motivations and incentives and of collection was a you know was something that is a ripe area. It's there's very little known about that, and so part of the um, part of the thinking was well, if we could potentially understand that better, we could have a big impact on that because right now. To my understanding, there's not a whole lot that we really can figure out about that right now, you know, which is short of we put up a bin and hope people will go by and drop it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it just underscores how how we say this all the time, but really how interdisciplinary this problem is. Right. This is something that I can't just solve as a chemical engineer. Right. So um, this is the the kind of all hands on deck approach that we need the behavioral psychologists and the environmental educators, et cetera, on board um, to really make this a reality. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, just get your thoughts. I know you're not a policy wonk, but I'm just curious, right? If we think about like in the case of lead acid batteries, where we recycle in this country at least over 90%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here we are with lithium ion batteries where 95% goes into the landfills. Yep. You know, we have so much that we could do there. And in your sense, if you were the guru, if you were the policy guru god, and you could wave your wand and said, okay, you know, how would you incentivize uh, or put in a place, you know, and what lessons can we learn from say the lead acid batteries to enable this? Yeah, I think I would center it. I would kind of have a, a two pronged approach where manufacturers could do like a, like you get a rebate, the consumer gets a rebate when they return the battery. And I think we can also take advantage of the fact that many people buying electric vehicles are do have the environment or climate change or sustainability as at least one of their motivators. And so I think a little bit of education when you buy the EV to say like, you probably haven't thought about this yet, but did you know? Um, I think we could easily leverage that, easily is a strong word. I think we could leverage that there's already that motion towards um, sustainability that is driving people to purchase EV um, EVs uh, that I think we could leverage that to think about end of life as well. But it is kind of like a two, it's a chicken and egg problem because the recycling, our recycling methods aren't quite there yet <laughs> to uh, be able to um, convincingly recycle the batteries uh, at the scale we want to, but we also need more batteries to recycle to, to get them, to get those processes to that scale. So it's a bit of chicken and egg, but I think we need to go from both sides. Yeah, fantastic. You know, you might not sort of bring us to the uh, to the question of scalability, which is which is one of the key questions I have, is right now in, in your assessment and stuff, are the processes um, essentially ready to scale? You know, so I know you talked about Redwood, you talked about some of the other ones, and we know we're gonna have this amount of batteries coming, right? Because we see that already with the number of EVs that are purchased. So five, 10 years now, it's gonna be coming. Are, are, is your sense right now and understanding that these processes are essentially really to scale? You know, the, the you know the size that you study and stuff, you just replicate it or whatever. You mm -hmm. know, how far are we along on that? Yeah, I think it's really a spectrum. Some of the technologies are ready to scale yesterday because they've been done at scale and they're actually extraction processes just adapted. Um, in terms of the selective uh, approaches, those aren't, I would not say are ready to scale yet, uh, but we still have the spectrum of like, even with the adsorbents I mentioned, right? We can use commercial adsorbents and change the process a little bit. Now we've got something that's a little bit more drop in place versus trying to design membranes where membrane modules haven't been used in, that, that would be the most nascent approach. So right. I'm often in, of the mind that we need both the like new nascent work that will get commercialized in 10, 15 years. And we need the kind of turnkey solutions um, that will get us part of the way there. And I think sometimes the discussion can get to a place of like, which is better? And we should, as if we put all our money into one technology. And I just think that's so rarely the most good idea. <laughs> yeah, it's just, so I'm always like, I, so you'll note that even in, like when I do a life cycle assessment, it's very rare for me to say like, well, this approach was the best, right? It's more like, this is the best in these circumstances, right? Um, and so I think we can try to, and again, that's like a mindset thing from a research perspective, but rather than winners and losers, it's sort of like, okay, well, where does this make sense? And the answer might be, it doesn't make sense yet, but it would be great as a field to know why it doesn't make sense and what conditions would have to change for it to make sense. And if those conditions never change, then it's not like we should spend billions of dollars on that. But I don't know, it just comes down to like a diverse research portfolio from my perspective. Well, I, th I think your, uh, your work on these... Um these membranes and essentially customizing them or using different uh, 
aspects of him to induce the properties to allow separation and collections of his fascinating and exciting work. And potentially, I think, uh, uh, groundbreaking if you're, you know, if you're able to achieve it, because the, uh, the, the way of doing it, of just filtering it or uh, regenerating is going to be, I would imagine, even on that chart that you show with the energy and everything else, it's going to be even way lower. You may not yes, even yes, see, yes. see it show up there, right? So right, it's very the exciting. It's, yeah, it's incredibly exciting. Um, so let me just uh, turn and see uh, the questions from the audience. What is the chemical origin of high desorption of lithium and low desorption of magnesium and calcium? What is the chemical, what, sir? Chemical origin. I'm oh. not sure I can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, of loads, okay, yeah. So it's mainly that it's it's less about the ions themselves and more about their valence. So and, uh, you can just think of the um, kind of, I'll approximate here, but like that charge, the charge density, if you will, a magnesium ion is is more charged per space than a lithium ion. And so if I'm attracting it with a, a negatively charged resin, the the divalence will always beat out the monovalence. So that's the that's the chemical origin of why the divalence are are more likely to be attracted to the negatively charged uh, surface. Fantastic. Okay, uh, maybe we can go ahead and bring uh, uh, back, and we'll have a discussion with three of us. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's interesting. That actually, uh, there was a whole bunch more questions that came in about lithium. <laughs> so I'm uh, just going to go ahead and just uh, uh, one of the questions actually that came in from an audience member was a, a question around petrol lithium. And, you know, particularly and sort of what are your thoughts about uh, and can you comment on petrol lithium? Yeah, um, actually, at some uh, uh, listen industry conferences, I uh, met uh, several people who were uh, promoting uh, recovering lithium from um, brines that uh, is really when you we, we have all have heard of fracking, so you have to yeah. inject hot water underground uh, to uh, to crack the, uh, the the rocks to recover uh, petroleum. Then that water, when you go uh, get it up, uh, contains some ppm. I think it's even lower than salt. Uh, remember we talk about salt and sea. In right. California, yeah, uh, it's a it's a it's a, um, a southern sea. If I remember correctly, it's a, on the order of hundred ppm. This is slightly lower, but still significant considering in seawater. In seawater, it's less than one ppm. Listen, so even you have a fifty, that's significant higher. But in Atacama, it's a one thousand ppm. I give you perspective. Yes, oh, uh, there is a lithium, but the challenge is that the concentration is low. I think if we, the world needs more lithium, um, at the end of the day, we have to look at the old source of lithium. Uh, people will have to uh, work out um, economic process to recover the lithium that uh, come out of uh, uh, petrol, uh, petroleum production. Um, I think it, there's an added challenge here compared to Southern Sea geothermal. Geothermal pumping everything is free because they, they, they the 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 brine is comes up by uh, power station. They 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 uh, power generation. They have to pump. You just yeah. simply add a filter. Here you will have to work with uh, oil people to um, to develop a process and to have the equipment on their site. And also, yeah. I uh, my understanding is that the the well life uh, for the uh, the um, uh, uh, shell gas or oil. It's uh, relatively uh, shorter than the conventional one, so they keep on moving. Uh, so you don't have an oil well that the oil well will, will stay there for decades yeah. compared to a power station. So you have to develop some some ways. You keep moving with them <laughs> to, um, to to develop uh, to extract lithium from that source. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Ian. So, Will, one of the questions uh, actually uh, was around with these new technologies that you're developing, um, like the uh, the membrane stuff. Have you actually talked about and potentially explored uh, incorporating these in battery manufacturing? Where may they, they might have residues or other things, and they will be, you know, a, a way to to not have uh, that in their wastewater or other streams. In fact, get that out as a value. Is that something which you've explored or are we just imagining? 
<laughs> that's a fantastic question. In short, um, no, we haven't. Uh, and that's simply just because we haven't built formal, and when I say we, my lab, we haven't built um, formal collaborations with battery manufacturers yet. But I think that's a great way to think about a more constrained version of the problem, potentially, that sort of lets us like get a foothold onto um, into the more uh, ambitious recycling um, affair, if you will. Um, yeah, but that's a great thought. We've had sort of preliminary conversations, a lot of them through StorageX with um, where could electrochemical approaches be useful. Um, and uh, yeah, but that's definitely something I would be open to and I think is a really great idea to pursue. Yeah, so let me just take that one step further. Yuan, as in your role in your space, uh, as someone who's been in this a long time, looking at some of the stuff that uh, that Professor Tarpe is looking at, uh, you know, could you see some applications for this uh, within uh, the mines and extraction processes that you are familiar with in traditional traditional routes? Yeah, um, well, actually, um, if you look at the extraction, lithium extraction past uh, 20 years, I would think there's a lot of uh, non-traditional technology is being promoted. It, uh, so uh, people heard a, a lot about the uh, direct lithium extraction, uh, first practiced by my old employer, FMC Lithium, now called Livent in Argentina. And there's a more, uh, actually the, the developers working on Southern Sea, uh, they're trying to use the direct lithium extraction as well, because that's the only way. <laughs> you can have a precipitation evaporation pond there. So, so and, and also in uh, Qinghai, China, the brines there, solars there tend to have a, a, a challenge of very high compared to South American solars, the magnesium to lithium ratio significantly higher. So they have uh, developed technology or in some membrane technology or what I heard in, in the practice there to separate as uh, prof uh, Professor uh, Tarpet just mentioned, divalent, uh, monovalent with, uh, with, uh, with a membrane. So uh, I have been seeing um, I think 20, if you turn the clock back 20 years ago, this space is pretty steady. The last 10 years, you see a lot of new technologies that, um, be, because this space has start, start to attract a lot more attention. When you have more right. attention, more investment, then you have more researchers coming in to start to work on it. You will see more technologies and more innovation, which is good. Okay. Fantastic. I mean, I, I, and, and, I, think I just add uh, in the uh, lithium battery uh, uh, recycling, um, uh, purification um, and the processing towards the back end uh, is important, but the OE, uh, more importantly is front end. When you got a half a ton of battery pack, how you safely sort them and, uh, and uh, cut them into pieces is very important as well. Um, I, I, I ask people to pay more attention there because once um, the elements in solution, um, this it, it become very standard to chemical engineering. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And I think uh, I think that point was made in a number of places and with a number of people that we've talked with, you know, um, and you know, I think even one idea was mentioned forth: can you standardize batteries, <laughs> you know, battery packs, and then uh, make it uh, easy? Then you know. Is a standard way of disassembly and stuff. I, I, I actually I would ask for it because it, it, it it's painful. Even even charging, um, I used to have a, a Nissan Leaf. I installed a charger for the Nissan Leaf, and I bought a Tesla, and then I have to have adapter because Tesla charging is not compatible with the other one. So we don't even have a standard uh, standardized uh, uh, charging for our iPhones versus uh, Android phones. So <laughs> that that's really regulatory. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, I think of that as, uh, you know, another form of permitting where, you know, trying to, you know, trying to get standards or formalizations about this that allows you to explore these things, which I think are low hanging fruit, uh, in many cases can be very challenging and quite, quite a long time to get established, actually, too, uh, which makes it very, uh, makes it very difficult to implement. Uh, so, um, I don't think... So I don't have any other questions that I have, and the audience is uh, looks like it's pretty. Uh, most of the questions. Let me see. There's one. Um, can you talk about the use of selective lithium extraction and direct lithium extraction 
to production of lithium from brines and rocks. Uh, yep. Um, again, it's, it's all about economics. Uh, depends on the your your resource. Uh, by the way, um, this typically used for brine based. It's not used uh, for hard rock uh, because the processing uh, people pretty much already mastered the process to process spodumene. Um, so this is really for brine based. And now brine based, uh, if you have, it depends on what kind of the nature of your resources. If you have a resource um, that's as good as, say, Atagama or yeah. as a Tucker Pass, you don't actually, you don't need selective uh, uh, absorption because if the uh, uh, more uh, standard conventional ways uh, turn out to be cheaper. However, if you are working on a more challenging resource, uh, say dirty brine, I'll say you have to remove a lot of impurities. A lot of impurities start to interfere uh, mm -hmm. with, for instance, magnesium. If you have a lot of magnesium, it's very hard to concentrate your brine because when magnesium drop out, it takes lithium. There's a, a salt that have a one molar magnesium, one molar lithium. It drop out and then you lose you you, uh, you lose the lithium to that. I think in that kind of a or or places like uh, uh, Southern Sea, you have a very low concentration. So uh, 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 challenging brine resources uh, tend to require this kind of a selective uh, absorption. This kind of a technology is more suitable for. Uh, but I think we will see this more and more because as we the volume demand become higher and higher, we will have to look at also. Uh, less desirable resources, then you have to ap uh, apply, deploy right. this kind of technology. Right, right. Fantastic. So um, I know that, uh, uh, Will, you may not be able to join us for backstage. So I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to ask each other questions. <laughs> if you have any to ask each other, since uh, uh, we may not be able to have that opportunity in the backstage. Is there any questions you would like to ask each other? I think the audience has asked several of mine to Joan. I feel like I'm still getting used to understanding the lithium challenge at scale. Um, but one I had, I think, is that you showed uh, the kind of artist rendering of the plant in the um, the Thacker Pass. Um, mm -hmm. And in the corner, there is a sulfuric acid production part. Yeah. What is yeah. what is that for? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and and said, why are you doing uh, it on the, site? Yes. Yeah, to, uh, to, for acid leaching, this is pretty uh, uh, almost the same as... Uh, uh, leaching lithium from spodumene, mm -hmm. so you need sulfuric acid. Uh, in our economic model, uh, it's uh, cheaper to produce uh, uh, sulfuric acid on site than mm -hmm. to truck in sulfuric acid from far away. That's why uh, in our plan, we're going to build a sulfuric acid on site right there. That's why. Got it. And probably in part because it's so remote, right? Here, yeah, back yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so there was one more question actually for you, Will, uh, from an audience that just came in. Is there any energy benefit to chemical slash physical ion separation versus electrical, electrochemical ion separation? Oh, yeah, good question. It actually ties into the question I just asked you on, actually. Any <clears throat> time you're using chemicals, acid or base, say sulfuric acid, that's actually a regenerant that we use in some of our processes. You have to get it to the site. And so that means you're paying the co the, the monetary cost of transport, but you're also paying the emissions costs of, if you will, that you're paying, you're spending emissions to get that um, chemical to you. So that's borrowing from some of the insights from wastewater treatment, where actually a sizable portion of the embedded, the life cycle energy, energy um, and greenhouse gas emissions for treating like municipal wastewater actually come from the chemicals that we add because we add so many, so much of them to stabilize different steps of the process that on site. Uh, generation of these same same logic as Yuan was just getting at um, can be really productive in a cost monetary cost sense and then from an environmental perspective as well. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, so I have it, a, I have a question for Will. On uh, actually, it's more of a comment than um, than, than, than question. You you showed us a wonderful war with the membrane uh, separation. I uh, have you considered? I think it's uh, not only useful for recy uh, battery recycling, but also, as I mentioned earlier, for some challenging 
Los Embrian resources. It could be right. applicable as well. Have you considered uh, working with uh, those people <laughs> on, on, on your methodology? Yeah, that's a good point. We have just started uh, working with um, Exxon Mobil on some of their uh, extraction from brine um, uh, approaches. Um, but yeah, again, that's a, a, a new step for us. So one we're still learning about. Um, but that's, I think, our where we're starting is like, and where we always start as uh, aqueous chemistry people, I guess, is like, what's the composition of the wastewater? What selectivity is needed? Um, and what can we do to achieve that? What steps can we take to achieve that? But like you said, every source is different. And so there will be different approaches that we can think about there. Yeah, and the other comment I want to make, um, uh, recycling, it's that uh, to your question, uh, Jimmy, earlier, um, it's that uh, uh, it will simplify recycling a lot more if there's some sort of a regulatory approach uh, to spent battery, uh, get sorted out by OEM. So uh, see, see if you uh, or the battery are mixed, uh, it will become big mess. There's a lot of energy and money is spent on uh, treating unknown source. Yeah. But if let's say if you, um, uh, I, I'm a Tesla driver at the end of life, and I will return that to him. And if right. I drive a GM, it will return to GM. Right. They know exactly. The nature of the history, or you can a uh, first small, small amount of money, so some sort of chip on that battery pack. Right. Know exactly when the battery was uh, manufactured, the composition, everything. Right. So that will go a long way. And then the recycler will see those known battery from OEM, not from a consumer, from consumer method. You never know <laughs> the nature yeah. of the history. But if you receive, if you receive the, today, I, I know they receive most of their battery uh, material from. Uh, factory scrap, which is easy, but say in 10 years, a lot of car battery will start to retire. Right. If recyclers receive battery already sorted by OEM, which is easy if you have a chip on the pack, right. it can be done automatically with computers. Yeah. Then, then uh, it will be a lot simpler and cheaper to recycle. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. In fact, I always go back to the lead acid example, where when you buy a new battery that you buy it from your dealer, you know, there is automatically a, a charge there uh, that's built into that, you know, it's credit yep. toward when you return yep. your old battery. Environmental levy. Right. And so there's already a system and a uh, expectation in place, which is facilitated. And then the dealer ramps them all up and so on. Uh, so this is part of the thinking that I think... It, uh, many many of our policymakers need to think through in order to enable this and do it before we already have these amount of batteries going to various places and unknown sources. Is as these um, as these car dealerships uh, and new EV batteries come online, right? How do we enable and facilitate that whole recycling process and and from known resources? Exactly. You know, my nightmare when I see recycling is when I, there's a recycling plastic bin, right? And they give you this long list of only the plastics that fit this criteria. And I'm just like looking at them, I'm just like, yeah, good luck with that, right? <laughs> yeah. Everybody's gonna throw anything that looks plastic to them in it's there. A, it's, right? a, it's a challenge, it's very challenging for consumer electronic type of battery, right. but it shouldn't be uh, like that for EV battery because no one will throw their EV in their uh, right. garbage bin. It will usually 99% of the time is good return to dealers or trade right. in. So it should be uh, easier to return the battery to the OEM yeah, than you know, to the recycler. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the models I look at also is for Apple's recycling process, uh, you know, and, and how they incentivize that and, you know. Yeah, how they, offer, they offer, they um, offer, so when I uh, bought my last uh, uh, new iPad, they offer some, uh, I forgot, 50 or $100 for me to return my old iPad. Hey, is that, well, I have no use of my old iPad, so might as well just return it to them, yeah. which is good. Oh, I agree, you know, and I think you were more successful than I did. And maybe it's because your iPad was uh, more recent. But I remember going there with a stack of old iPhones, and these were much older, right? They just were, you know, just sitting in a corner. And I brought them. They, and I should, said, offer, they should increase that rebate for right, iPhones. Right, that was part of my... Pretty, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm glad I, you know, I, I'm glad I helped you collect it, right? Uh, and, 
you know, uh, and that was the full incentive, you know, that they offered was that, oh, we have a place where you can put your old uh, iPhone materials. Uh, anyway, fantastic. I'd like to thank you, Will uh, Tarpe and Will, and uh, thank you, Yang Dao, for participating in this, uh, this very informative uh, and uh, very important, and even it's going to just become more important as we wrap uh, on this. And uh, I hope you guys have fun, and I hope that everyone learned something. And uh, since we're finishing a little bit early, Will, I hope you can join us a little bit for backstage because we have a uh, we have a number of people, and I'm sure in some cases they probably just want to uh, meet you and potentially ask you a few of their questions. Uh, okay, so, so should we uh, start the backstage earlier too? So yes, I, I recommend that we start the backstage. Lock in there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for the listeners are, who are participating in our backstage, let's go ahead and finish uh, this symposia now, and then go ahead and. Uh, transfer over to our backstage. Uh, just a quick announcement. Um, so um, please uh, join us for registering registering for our upcoming additional winter symposia, which is on Friday, March 10th on minerals for 500 terawatt hours of energy storage. Where we are now see this stationary storage really going up and becoming very important. Uh, and how do we supply the minerals for that kind of scale? Um, by Professor Jeff Kyers and Grace Boosie here at Stanford. And then on May, on March 24th, uh, with Professor Dan Kamen and Megan Mauter uh, on approaching grid energy storage from a systems perspective. Systems perspective. So lots of exciting materials coming and we look forward to facilitating all these kind of activity within our Stanford storage X community and other activities. Thank you all. Be safe, be well, and we'll see you at the backstage for those who are joining. Bye-bye, everyone.